Lala Fatima, the wife of Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib. Right. And he titled this story, The Lady Whose Eyes Are Fixed on Paradise. I'm telling you, nobody uh, enjoys old age more than the people of Allah. They spend all their time in dhikr and their focus is all on uh, the moment their soul leaves their heart, their, their body, and they have that and experience the, the, the ruh without the limitations of the body. An important part of the infrastructure of the Zawiya lies with the women. Often hidden from view, they organize many things behind the scenes and produce meals for the fuqara who would often arrive unexpectedly at inconvenient hours. During my later visits, Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib's widow, Lala Fatima, would always appear from behind the Zawiya's large wooden door, welcoming me and asking about the well-being of my family and my friends. I was always amazed by how much she resembled Sidi Muhammad himself. There was a softness about her like that of the Shaykh. She had walked her own path towards overcoming the ego and was a wali in her, her own right. A lifetime of companionship seemed to have blurred the lines between them. In her, you could see the Shaykh, even after his passing. It was as if they had fused. Aware that... There were so few women in this book. In 2004, I sent a message asking to photograph the surviving wives of the sheikh. To my surprise, they agreed. However, I was unable to make the trip until 2006. When I suddenly felt an urgent impulse to go to McNess. You know, England to McNess is a quick flight. However, I was uh, went to 2006. I, I arrived with my wife who promptly disappeared into the women's domain. She returned uncertain whether we would get a photograph of her or not of Lala Fatima because she was very ill. Miraculously, she was much better the next day. And as I entered the women's area and looked into her eyes, I saw someone who was inwardly already in paradise. Despite her frail health, she welcomed us warmly, asking about our children and our mutual friends as she moved out into the courtyard to sit before my camera. Within six weeks, I received news of her death. These people, at the end of their lives, everyone surpassed you. The community doesn't truly need you anymore. They surpass you in service. They're brighter than you. They're smarter than you when you get older. Uh, they relate better, right? They're relating to the, to, the, to the world better, to the youth better, especially as the world keeps changing so quickly. So what's left for the elderly? What is the advantage of the elderly? It's... Their spirituality. Their nefs is no longer strong anymore. Imagine you're, all your life you're fighting this wild horse. Sometimes it obeys, sometimes it doesn't. Well, as the horse grows older, he stops resisting so much. And if you, simultaneously to that, have trained it how to remember Allah, go to Masajid, feed people, attend these gatherings, right? Remain silent and stop arguing. That stays and that increases while the resistance of the nafs decreases. You become like one of these awliya. You gotta go, okay. All day and all night in different khidmah. No sadness. La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. No sadness, no grief. All day. And that's why you need a community to do this. You need a community. Right? Um... You need a jama'ah to have these gatherings and to be able to attend without needing attention in the gathering. That's the key. The nafs has to be trained. Don't worry about attention. Do not become an addict for attention. Okay. You get that as Imyazi says here, an nafs al mutma'inna. Now, what I've been telling my ego to do for 40 years, finally, the horse is too weak now to rebel. I wasn't successful at controlling it in its prime. But now that it's old, it doesn't even rebel. Okay. Look at the next picture here. This is Lala Zuleikha. And look at the Zilij behind her. It's beautiful. That Moroccan tile is called Zilij. This is the humble servant of the Zawiya, the wife of, another wife of Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib. She had been the youngest of the Sheikh's wives, but she was originally from Algeria, not Morocco. We sat with uh, this great lady in her small room where she had little more than a thin mattress on the floor and a small butane tank she used to make us tea. 
The room felt more like a camp than a residence, reflecting the Prophet's words, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, on the fleeting nature of this hayat al dunya, this life. I am in this world like a traveler who takes shelter in the shade of a tree before resuming his journey. So look what she absorbed from her husband, from the Shaykh. This is Zuhd. Okay. Spammers. Tons of spammers always. Getting time to sit in her presence was an immense honor as the women of the house assumed values of service and humility as adeptly as the men, if not more. And she was often busy serving the community. She did, she did this quite anonymously, cooking food for people who never saw her, embodying the belief that fame and reputation are dangerous and they're a distraction from life's true goal. And they're as dangerous as material luxuries. Fame and material luxuries are dangerous. These are dangerous things. Extremely dangerous. In October of 2017, I visited McNess with a good friend who had never had the opportunity to travel to Morocco since he had a history of heart problems. I was concerned for his well-being, but he was keen to visit. And we timed it so that he could be back in London for another heart operation. I really wanted him to experience the Habibiya Zawiya. This is where all these people are. are they're living in this area called Habibiya, named after the Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib. It's like a little kingdom inside the country, but a kingdom for fuqara, for humble people, for uh, you know lovers of remembrance. He says that as we entered, Lala Zulaikha, the last surviving widow of the Sheikh, was sitting by the Sheikh's tomb. As soon as she saw my friend, she says, I've been waiting for you. I have seen you seven times before. In other words, she's had visions of him seven times. She immediately put her hand on his heart and started making du'a for him. This was the first time they had ever met. Afterwards, I thought this could have been the pre-op before the operation awaiting him back home. Nine weeks after the meeting, Lala Zulaikha was laid to rest. She died. Okay. And she was buried next to her husband. Her passing was the end of an era, but I'm truly grateful to have had this last meeting with her in the world. 